Let's come to worship our Lord. Look at this, looking at Proverbs chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honour the Lord with your wealth and the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be overflowing with new wine. And of course, the point of that passage is, is that Obviously, if we're going to come before the Lord and put him before all things, the Lord's hand will be upon us and his blessings also. So we've come to worship our Lord this day. Let's just come before him in prayer. Well, our Father in heaven, we do come before you with gratitude, thanks and praise. You are the living God. There is none like you. And in all things, O oh Father God, we are mindful that uh, your word reveals uh, your splendor and your, 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 your greatness. And uh, as we read in the Psalms, Father God, that uh, wherever we go, there you are. Where can man go from you? Even before a word is upon our lips, you know it ever so well. And this knowledge is too much for us. Mm. We cannot comprehend it. And so, Father God, we are aware that you are all-knowing, all-powerful and ever-present. And we are thankful that our God is not some weak and sipid thing can do nothing like the gods of this world. You are the Almighty, and there's nothing you cannot do. You are the creator of all things. And not only did you create all things, you continue to sustain and provide for all the peoples of this world, and particularly your extra blessings upon those who are your children. And as we come to worship you this day, Lord God, we come before you with that holy reverence, understanding of your greatness, your majesty and your splendor, and as we do so, Father God, um, we do come before you and humble ourselves. And yet, Father God, we come also in the knowledge that you are a loving Heavenly Father and you love us ever so much that you would give your only begotten Son that whoever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And it is this amazing work of salvation that we are reminded of, God, reminded of again, O Lord God, as we come into your presence that we may truly come to you through the Lord Jesus, being brought into your, your kingdom, to your household, to receive the Lord Jesus and be called children of God. Thank you so much. You are our Heavenly Father, and you do love us and you embrace us. And with this knowledge, O oh Father God, may it be that we, O oh Lord, uh, would continue to come before you. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us, to teach us, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth and to give you that praise, that glory and the honour that you alone deserve, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. For we come in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing praise to our Lord, shall we? One, one thousand in our, our mission praise. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, living in me. Number one thousand. <laughs>
first part of our reading today is from Joshua chapter 10 and verses 1 to 11. Joshua chapter 1, chapter 10 verses 1 to 11 and, and then Graham will finish off the reading later on for us. Last week, we, <clears throat> last week we understood about the aspect of uh, the Gibeonites, their deception, and how they ended up making a covenant with Israel. And the, the passage picks it up from there. As soon as Adonazedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, um, doing to I and his kings as he had done to Jericho and its king and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. He feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities and because it was greater than I and all of its men were warriors. So Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham king of Hebron, and to uh, Piram, king of Zarmuth, and Zaphir, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me, and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. And then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Zamuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua into the camp of Gilgal, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us, for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear for them, for I have given them into your hands, for not a man of them shall, shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgal. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Horon and struck them as far as Azekah and Machadah. And they fled before Israel. While they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Amen. So, we have some little ones with us today. You guys like to come up the front? Are. What are they? Balls. They are. That's exactly what they are. So, now first of all, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever seen hail? You've not seen hail, that ice that falls out of the sky and clumps them. No, not even little bits. Never seen hail. You must be deprived. <laughs> well, if you ever see ice falling out of the sky, in pieces like that or bigger, you know it's called hail. Okay, you ever seen pictures of it? Jump on the internet and have a look. Okay, now, so this is something, here, catch that. Do you reckon hail feels like that if it's ice? You squeeze it. No, why is that? It's soft, isn't it? It doesn't. <laughs> That's soft, it wouldn't be like that, would it? If it's hard, if it's ice, it doesn't. It wouldn't be like that, would it? Nah, because that wouldn't even hurt you, would it? It'd just bounce off your head and go, oh, that was fun. Okay. But maybe, have you ever seen, like sometimes people talk about hail the size of golf balls. Could you imagine something like that falling out of the sky and bonking you in the head? That could hurt. This is not a real golf ball, so it wouldn't hurt very much. But they are quite heavy, you can feel it, yes. 
Okay, but yeah, if you could imagine. So I remember my father telling me that back in the 1930s, there was this massive hailstorm where we grew up the other side of Ipswich. He said the hail was bigger than golf balls, and, and when I was your age, the scars were still on the trees. Okay? That was many, many years later. Okay? So it damaged, it did a terrible lot of damage. You feel that's quite hard, isn't it? Okay. All right. Yeah, so that's a bit harder. Thanks, my chief. All right. So, sometimes they can be as big as a tennis ball. Can you imagine a hailstone as big as that hard ice, like if you get out of the freezer, falling from the sky and bonking you in the head? You think that'd hurt? Yeah. You don't think it'd hurt? You should try that sometime. <laughs> All right. What about something the size of a cricket ball? All right, that's not a real one, it's a spongy one. Uh, so I cheated. So if you've got a cricket ball, you can have it. That's the size of it, okay? Okay? So when I tell you about my father, I said, you'll never see another hailstorm like that. 1979, I think it was the 4th of December, we had a hailstorm. And it was bigger than that. All right? It was bigger. It was about the size of my hand. Okay? I know, because I was over the paddock on the tractor. And I was cultivating. I saw this green in the sky. All right? In the south of it. So it's usually a fair indication. Hail's when you see the sky going green. Okay? And so I thought, oh, I'll just finish this off and I'll go home. I had one run to do. Whack the tractor up in gear, open the throttle up flat out, got halfway across the paddock and poured down rain. I'm going, oh, I've got to go home. So I lifted the implement up and I went home. As I'm going home, this big hunk of hail landed beside me and bounced on the ground like that. Left a dint in the ground. Imagine it hit me on the head. I reckon that would hurt. Okay, so I'm thinking, this is special. So I jumped off the tracks <laughs> and grabbed it just to find there was a few more falling around me. All right, and I went around behind the, the, the barn where we had the machinery, and I got off the tractor, and uh, my brother was inside, and I go, oh, my car's out of that. <laughs> and I go, I can't get it. He says, don't go out there, you'll die. So he gave me a cardboard box to put over my head. <laughs> True. Is it? And as I'm running out to get my car, okay, I got hit on the shoulder, right there with a big hunk of hail, and it pushed me back and really knocked me onto the ground. Oh. See how big the hail was. And then a piece hit me in the shin and opened my shin up and I bled everywhere. Okay, but I had a box over my head, so it didn't hurt my head. It was a great thought, that was. It would have really hurt to hit me in the head. I got in the car and it was like driving on ice. You wouldn't think, would you? And we, so I'll go around and I'll park in the garage. But my dad had parked the Fergie tractor in front of the garage because it had an umbrella. And I couldn't get the, the way. And my dad jumped on the track and a piece of hail hit him on the backside. He jumped off and went, yeah. <laughs> so I had to park under the paparina tree. And we had free range chooks and they were running under my car. I'm trying to hold the windscreen. And at the end of that, the place was an absolute mess. And of course, you'll never see another hailstorm like that. But in 1984, <laughs> five years later, after my dad had passed away, we had one that was a lot worse. It had 180 kilometer an hour winds with it, and the hail that was bigger. They recorded this down at the Ambly Air Base. Okay, the hail was so big that it killed some of our cattle. Okay, it was massive. All right, and it wrecked a whole pile of houses around the whole community. All right, and we hadn't long built a house on our dad's farm, my dad's farm, and it was still fairly new. And for some amazing reason, we didn't even have a dented roof. But everybody else had broken windows and wrecked roofs and everything else. Okay, that was massive. And there was trees like that, which were twisted off. Okay, so you probably weren't listening to this before, but it tells us in this passage here that I read from in verse 11, where am I find Joshua chapter 10, verse 11, that the Israelites went to battle against all these five kings, right, and God was with them. Verse 11 says, And they fled before Israel 
And when they were going down the ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw large hailstones, large stones from heaven on them as far as Azarkah. And they died because of the hail. And there was more who died from the hailstones than what there was by Israel fighting with them. Wow. Do you think it's happened? Do you think it's possible? Absolutely. I know it's possible. I've been hit with a big hailstone. I know how much it hurts. I've seen our cattle dead because of hailstones. I know how bad it can be. Yeah, it's sad. Yeah, but look, you know, whopping big hailstones. Mm. So can God do that? Absolutely. All right. Is it sad that people disobey God? Yes, it is. Absolutely. And that wouldn't have happened if they hadn't disobeyed God. But how about, how about if the hailstones were that big? <laughs> You think that would do it? Yeah, yeah, that might hurt even more, right? Eh? Yeah. So we should give thanks to God that he has given us the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can come to God and know him. So let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you so much for your great love and your mercy. But Lord, at the same time, you hate disobedience and you hate those who completely turn their back on you in the sense, not what we understand hatred, but that you, are, you, oh Lord God, deal with them. But at the same time, Father God, you are very patient and not wishing that any would perish. And so when we read about stories like this in the Bible, it reminds us of how wicked these people really were, that you would deal with them. And I pray for the young ones, Lord God, that you would help them to walk in your ways, to look to you, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that you would bless them all the days of their life. And so be with us each one, Father God. And two, Lord, as we bring our gifts and tithes today, I pray that you would take those things and use them in your kingdom's work. And thank you for all your blessings to us, each one, as we come before you. Help us to walk in your ways to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name we ask all this. Let's stand and sing our praise to our Lord, shall we? 788, you are beautiful beyond description to marvellous for words. Number 788. <coughs>
continuing on from verse uh, 12 and chapter 10, Joshua. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Helion. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies, as it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makkedah. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makkedah, he said, Roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop. Pursue your enemies, attack them from the rear, and don't, them, don't let them reach their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. So Joshua and the Israelites destroyed them completely, almost to a man. But the few who were left reached their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makkedah, and no one had uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. So they brought the five kings out of the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarkave, sorry, uh, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. When they had brought these kings to Joshua, he had summoned all the men of Israel and said to the army commanders who had come with him, Come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. So they came forward and placed their feet on their necks. Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees, and they were left hanging on the trees until evening. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. And may God bless to us this reading from this word. We're going to pray. Let us bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word. And there are times as we read it, and uh, it seems sort of something which is uh, hard to understand. But we thank you for your Holy Spirit to reveal to us the truth of these things. And as we uh, as we look to you this day in your word, we pray that our Father God, you might give us an understanding of these things. Lord, we thank you for the way in which you continue to uh, work in the lives and the hearts of your people throughout this world. And we are mindful, Father God, that uh, many Christians are under, under severe persecution um, as uh, those who are opposed to the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and uh, we live in a world where, uh, well, that doesn't seem to happen so much here. There may be those who don't like us, but well, we don't see that sort of stark... Um, that contrast that we see in many places and and Lord God as we know there are there are certain countries which are much worse than others and uh, Burkina Faso is one of those dangerous places for Christians to live with much opposition many who die for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, we do pray for our brothers and sisters in that nation uphold them to you and pray Father God that even in the face of the adversity that they face persecution Lord that you would keep them strong bold that we go forth with your word knowing that father their reward is in your presence in the glory of our god and that they may uh, do all they do without fear and favor of man father god we uh we thank you too that as we're mindful of this that there is a, a mission work that is going on always various kinds whether it be metal medical work it might be it might be uh, work like math and they they, they they fly around helping people and uh and use the opportunities they have to uh, share the gospel. It might be it might be a straightforward uh, area where they go and teach the word of God or take the, take the Bible to people. And we we're mindful of that. We're thankful for that sort of ministry. But Father God, it is true here in Australia, right where we are. This is this is our mission field here on our doorstep, 
And there are many who in Australia have no idea about the things of the Lord Jesus Christ, only things that they perceive, and they haven't read your word, they don't understand the things of yourself, and yet, Lord, this is part of our responsibility as your people to take your word to a perishing world, a world that is without the Lord Jesus, who are lost in their sins. And so, Father God, being mindful of this, we do pray that um, you would help us to be bold also. Father, we uh, pray for our, our brother, uh, Elder Lex Burke, who had to go to hospital because of uh, medical reasons, and uh, we uphold him to you, and pray, Father God, that they'll be able to sort those things out. And pray for Wendy, his dear wife, who has also got many physical problems, and uh, we ask, uh, Father God, that you would uh, look over her at this time as well. In all things, Father, we do thank you for the way in which you continue to guide us and, and, um, and bless us, each one. We pray for our nation, we pray for our governments, we pray for wisdom, for guidance for them. So often they follow the ways of the world and the wisdom of the world. And Lord, we pray that you may grant them the ability to see things as they should and to be unashamed to stand upon those things which are good and right, not those things that the world might call good, because so often the world thinks those things that are bad are good and those things that are good are bad. But upon those things that are good in your eyes, O oh Lord, we pray. And so in all of these things we come before you now and we give you thanks and praise for you are good and a gracious God and you bless us so much. And uh, pray that you would continue to look over us, we ask, and hear our prayers as we bring them before you. And the prayer that we would pray that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Let us sing pray, shall we? When, Lord, when the storms of life, eight, 886, Lord, when the storms of life arise, be near to keep me yet. <laughs> 